Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, talking about the imaginary climate crisis. In 1841, Charles McKay said, Men, it has been well said, think in herds, it will be seen that they go mad in herds, while they only recover their senses slowly and one by one. We don't have to speculate what the climate would be like at higher or lower CO2 levels, because we have millions of years of empirical data. I'm going to be discussing that in this video, but mostly I'm going to be talking about where the idea of a climate catastrophe or a climate crisis came from. Claims of climate catastrophe are driven largely by politicians, the press, social media, and publicity-seeking academics. They are not driven by science, as I'm going to show you. This is trending on Twitter today. People are reacting to a New York Times article recalling when Senator Ron Johnson offered a false etymology of Greenland to downplay the effects of global warming. And here's the story. Reed Epstein and Trip Gabriel confront Ron Johnson on his belief that Greenland was once green so climate change is just normal. There were a couple of statements by Ron Johnson which the New York Times authors were complaining about. One was that Senator Johnson said that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere helps trees grow. And the other was this statement from Senator Johnson. You know, there's a reason Greenland was called Greenland. It was actually green at one point in time. It's a whole lot wider now, so we've experienced climate change through geologic time. These New York Times writers boldly declared that Senator Johnson was presenting misinformation. But Senator Johnson was being quite accurate, and if New York Times writers actually read their own paper, they would have known that. This was in the New York Times, January 22, 1934. Greenland's increasingly cold climate may well be the real explanation of the mysterious disappearance of the Norse colonies, Professor Gregg suggested. They were first settled about 986 AD by Norwegians under Eric the Red and once attained a population as high as 3,000. After flourishing for more than 400 years, however, their communication with Norway was cut off in 1410, and a ship visiting Greenland in 1585 found no trace of them. Bodies of the ancient colonists have been found buried in ground that is now perpetually frozen, Professor Gregg said. In many of the graves, all tree roots have been found that had grown entirely throughout the buried bodies, penetrating even the marrow of the bones. These trees could not have grown in frozen soil, he pointed out, and it's unlikely the colonists would have dug many feet into frozen soil to bury their dead. So places where the Vikings lived in Greenland are now permafrost, but back when they lived there, there were trees growing there. It was very green when the Vikings lived there. So Senator Johnson was absolutely correct, but these arrogant, know-nothing journalists at the New York Times were attacking him anyway. The Vikings settled in Greenland during a time which was known as the Medieval Warm Period. But after the Medieval Warm Period ended, the Earth entered what was known as the Little Ice Age, and the Vikings likely froze to death. Quite a bit of ice accumulated in Greenland during that time. But by 1939, the glaciers of Greenland were rapidly melting. The leading Arctic expert, Dr. Hans Allman, said, all the glaciers in eastern Greenland are rapidly melting. It may without exaggeration be said that the glaciers of Greenland, like those in Norway, faced the possibility of a catastrophic collapse. This was in 1939 when atmospheric carbon dioxide was not much above pre-industrial levels. So we know that glaciers were melting very rapidly in 1939 in Greenland and Norway when carbon dioxide levels were quite low. This shows rather definitively that people who believe we can stop glaciers from melting by lowering carbon dioxide levels don't know what they're talking about. Now let's go back 6,000 years ago to a time when atmospheric carbon dioxide was at an historic low of 280 parts per million. The Geologic Survey of Norway believes that the Arctic may have been ice-free at that time. This tells us that the Arctic was much warmer than it is now, even though carbon dioxide levels were very low. People who are trying to correlate Arctic temperatures with carbon dioxide levels clearly have no clue what they're talking about. 4,000 years ago, trees grew all the way to the edge of the Arctic Ocean in Canada. Now the tree line is about 100 kilometers away. This is a fossilized tree stump from 4,000 years ago in what is now Arctic tundra. It had to have been much warmer back then. The theory that carbon dioxide controls Arctic temperatures is not compatible with the historical record. 
Just this week, a new paper was published saying that scientists have found frozen plant fossils preserved under a mile of ice on Greenland. And in 1897, the Smithsonian reported that small palm trees were found fossilized in Greenland. So Senator Johnson was absolutely correct, and the arrogant New York Times writers were completely wrong. A few years ago, the Niels Bohr Institute Department of Geophysics drilled down into the Greenland ice sheet. This is a temperature graph from Greenland going back in time. Greenland used to be much warmer, but around 5,000 years ago, temperatures plummeted there until about 2,000 years ago. Then Greenland warmed up during the medieval warm period when the Vikings lived there, but it got very cold again and the Vikings froze to death. The recent warming in Greenland has not been much above the coldest temperatures on record there. Senator Johnson was correct and the New York Times was completely wrong. Now let's look at where this disinformation campaign came from. In 2013, President Obama tweeted, 97% of scientists agree, climate change is real, man-made, and dangerous. But he just made those numbers up. That same year, the American Meteorological Society surveyed their professional members. They found that only 52% of their professional members believed that global warming was mostly man-made, and they weren't even asked if it was dangerous. There was no truth to President Obama's claim, but it was extremely good propaganda. And then a few weeks later, the president went on, We don't have time for a meeting of the Flat Earth Society, President Obama and those who continue to deny the science on climate change. This was a good example of bullying people who don't go along with the catastrophic global warming agenda. Which is exactly the same bullying which the New York Times authors are trying to do to Senator Johnson. In this picture is UN spokesman and high school dropout Leo DiCaprio, Catherine Hayhoe of Texas Tech University, and President Obama. She's been pushing catastrophic global warming for a long time and likes to hang out with politicians and movie stars. She also has me blocked on Twitter. I've been trying to get her to debate me, but she refuses because she says that I'm too sweet and agreeable. I attended a climate alarmist conspiracy theory movie, which she was the guest of honor at. The movie was titled Merchants of Doubt and was based around the idea that climate skeptics were funded by big oil to destroy the climate. The whole thing was pretty ridiculous and it was not an appropriate venue for me to confront her and Michael Mann. So I was very polite to her and now she uses that as an excuse not to debate me. But now let's look at the real reason why Catherine Hayhoe will not debate me. She's been pushing all kinds of very bad science and I've been calling her out on it. Catherine Hayhoe is one of the lead authors of the National Climate Assessment. Three years ago, the National Climate Assessment included this text, Increased Wildfire. Climate outweighed other factors in determining burned area in the western U.S. from 1916 to 2003, a finding confirmed by 3,000-year-long reconstructions of southwestern fire history. Between 1970 and 2003, Warmer and drier conditions increased burned area in western U.S. mid-elevation conifer forests by 650%. That sounds really bad, but why did they start their trend in 1970 after talking about 3,000 year-long studies and another one which started in 1916? What about the years before 1970? Let's take a look at what they're hiding before 1970. This is the complete graph from the U.S. Forest Service of burn acreage going back to 1916. You can see that it was much higher prior to 1970. The National Climate Assessment hid critical data showing that burn acreage used to be much higher because they wanted to show an increasing trend. The National Climate Assessment authors are intentionally misleading the public by hiding critical data. But this story gets worse. Just in the last few weeks, the Biden administration has hidden all of the data prior to 1983. And you can see that 1983 was the lowest year on record. As of January 29, 2021, the National Interagency Fire Center showed data all the way back to 1926. But now they've hidden all the data prior to 1983. And here's another even more important document which has been deleted by the Biden administration in the last few weeks. 
This was the 2001 version of the Federal Wildland Fire Management Policy, and it said, In the conterminous United States during the pre-industrial period, 1500 to 1800, an average of 145 million acres burned annually. Today only 14 million acres, federal and non-federal, are burned annually. So burn acreage is down 90% from the pre-industrial era. The Biden administration and the people who wrote the National Climate Assessment want the public to believe that fire burn acreage has increased as CO2 has increased, when in fact the exact opposite has occurred. They are doing propaganda, not science. Now let's look at another reason why the National Climate Assessment wanted to start their graph in 1970. This is the 1974 Global Temperature Graph from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. It shows that 1970 was actually quite cold. It was colder than 1870, and there had been a sharp cooling since the 1940s until 1970. The March 1, 1975 edition of Science News featured the Ice Age cometh and showed glaciers plowing through downtown Manhattan. On July 18, 1970, the New York Times said, U.S. and Soviet press studies of a colder Arctic. The United States and the Soviet Union are mounting large-scale investigations to determine why the Arctic climate is becoming more frigid, why parts of the Arctic sea ice have recently become ominously thicker, and whether the extent of that ice cover contributes to the onset of ice ages. The Arctic was very cold in 1970. Let's compare that to the 1939 article when the glaciers of Greenland and Norway were facing catastrophic collapse. Obviously 1970 was much colder than 1939. So the National Climate Assessment started their fire graph in 1970 and deleted the hot years of the 1930s and the 1940s. Once again, the people who wrote the National Climate Assessment are not doing science, they're doing propaganda. In 1974, The Guardian said, Space satellites show new ice age coming fast. And in 1978, The New York Times said, International team of specialists finds no end in sight to 30-year cooling trend in Northern Hemisphere. The 1970s were cold, and it's extremely misleading to start trends in the 1970s when you have data going back many years earlier. Now let's go back to today's New York Times attack on Senator Ron Johnson. The New York Times talks about Mr. Johnson's predilection for anti-intellectualism. On several occasions, he declared that climate change was not man-made, but instead caused by sunspots, and said excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere helps the trees grow. The New York Times authors imagine themselves to be intellectuals, but if they read their own newspaper, they would know that isn't true. On February 22, 1977, the New York Times wrote, Sun activity linked to drought and cold. Scientists cite lack of sunspots as clue to unusual weather. Sunspot cycles, which occur at intervals of 22 years and over longer periods of several hundreds of years, correlate strongly with periods of hot and cold, wet and moist weather on Earth. This is what the New York Times said in 1977. In February of 1967, National Geographic reported that sunspots control the behavior of glaciers. Dr. Hurt C. Willett, professor of meteorology at MIT, said, Sunspots have been diligently recorded for well over 200 years. We find that glacier fluctuations over these past two centuries show a tantalizing correlation taking into account the glacier's flow lag with sunstorms and temperature trends. So once again, Senator Johnson was agreeing with the scientists, but the New York Times writers were just a bunch of arrogant clowns. And on April 8, 1994, the Canberra Times reported, Sunspots linked to global warming. Gas is not dominant factor. Sunspots, rather than greenhouse gases from the burning of fossil fuels, may be responsible for the rise in global temperature in the past 200 years, it was claimed on Wednesday. Astronomers at Armagh Observatory in Northern Ireland have studied meteorological records going back to 1795, which point to a strong link between air temperatures on Earth and solar activity. The New York Times writers imagine themselves to be intellectuals, and George Orwell said, some ideas are so wrong that only an intellectual could believe them. Now let's go back and look at the New York Times article one more time. They're ridiculing Senator Johnson for saying that excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere helps the trees grow. But if the New York Times writers remembered their elementary school education, they would have known that carbon dioxide is the basis of all life on Earth. 
In order for plants to grow, they need sunlight, carbon dioxide, water, and chlorophyll. That's called photosynthesis. It's unfortunate that the New York Times intellectuals don't remember their primary school education. Five years ago, NASA reported that the increase in carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere over the past 35 years has made Earth much greener. And agriculturists say that the optimum CO2 level for plant growth is over 1,000 parts per million, which is more than double our current levels. Commercial greenhouse operators increase the carbon dioxide levels inside their greenhouses to above 1,000 parts per million because it makes the plants grow much faster and healthier. Senator Johnson got everything right, and the New York Times writers got every single thing wrong. Now let's look at what life was like on Earth when carbon dioxide levels were much higher, in fact at their peak of the last 600 million years. 540 million years ago during the Cambrian era, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were about 7,000 parts per million, which was more than 15 times higher than they are now. If you listen to climate alarmists, you would have believed that the oceans would have boiled away and Earth would have turned into something like Venus. But that's not what happened. The exact opposite occurred. 540 million years ago, when CO2 was at its peak, the greatest expansion of life on Earth occurred. Life loves carbon dioxide. Corals and shellfish evolved when CO2 was right at its peak. They didn't dissolve as climate alarmists would want you to believe. The historical evidence shows that there is no looming climate crisis. It's complete nonsense. It has nothing to do with science. I'm going to finish up with just one more topic about the politics of carbon dioxide. This graph shows atmospheric CO2 levels measured at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii going back to 1960. You can see that there's been a steady exponential increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And I've annotated all of the many government climate agreements which have occurred back to the year 1990. None of the international climate agreements have had any impact on the growth of CO2 in the atmosphere, including last year's lockdown, where 90% of the people were forced to stay home. Government does not control atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, and government certainly doesn't control the climate. So a thinking person would ask, what is the real government agenda? Toto has been pulling back the curtain on that question for the past 13 years. You can visit him in Kyrie on the web at realclimatescience.com.